The title of this psalm is An Unsinkable Faith. An Unsinkable Faith. We're first going to see David's dreadful plight, the situation that he's in, and then his desperate plea to the Lord, and then finally his devoted praise. David, hopefully like us, is learning no matter what is happening in life, we need to be praising Amen. the Lord. Amen. Because our circumstances may change, but the Lord doesn't. He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And because He doesn't change, we need to praise Him. Now, we've already mentioned that this psalm is penned by David. And I think it's important for us to also note that this is the second most quoted psalm in the New Testament. The second most quoted psalm. It is second to Psalm 22. So it's quoted in the Gospels, it's quoted in Romans, it's, it's quoted throughout the New Testament. And I find it interesting because it's a lament psalm. And I'm not sure that any psalm exceeds it and it's desperation. David finds himself in a very dark place. And it's also interesting that as David is crying out to the Lord, there are prophetic utterances that he's giving that's pointing to Christ, the Messiah. And no doubt what he was experiencing in the garden and on the cross, and even before that, we'll see some verses that are quoted uh, by uh, the Gospels concerning Jesus. But notice, David says, Save me, O God. That's a very complicated prayer, isn't it? Save me, O God. It's probably one of the most powerful prayers that anyone could pray. Save me, Lord. This is the same prayer that Peter prayed in Matthew chapter 14. Lord, if that's you, bid me come out on the water to where you are. Jesus said, come on. Peter steps out, and lo and behold, even though he's a rock, he doesn't sink. He starts walking to the Lord but he gets his eyes off of the Lord. He gets distracted by the wind and by the waves and he begins to sink. And when he sinks, this was his prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, creator of heaven and earth, the most, no, no, no. See, you don't have time for that. There's nothing wrong with those kind of prayers. I find it interesting that some people are like, well, long prayers are bad. Well, not if the motive is right. If the purpose is right. Now, if long prayers are for vain repetitions, to be seen and heard of men, yes, they're bad. But when we're in trouble, we need a quick cry out to the Lord. Anybody ever been in a situation where you didn't have time for a long prayer? You just, save me. <laughs> save me. David is saying, save me. And I want you to pay attention to the description that he uses for the situation that he's in. For the waters are come in unto my soul. The waters are come into my soul. I sink deep in mire where there is no standing. I am coming to deep waters where the floods overflow me. David says, the waters are coming to my soul. The waters are rising. And the situation is getting desperate, Lord. I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where you almost drowned. Anybody ever almost drowned? Wow. We need to take swimming lessons here at the porch. We need, if anybody can do that, we need to add that ministry. But that's, okay, but still, wow, that's... <laughs> it's, it's a terrifying feeling to think you are drowning. Anybody ever almost choke? Okay. 
Well, the same people who can't swim, can't chew. It was the same hands, right? We're all, we're all in desperate need to pray this prayer. Save me, God. How many of you emotionally ever felt like you were drowning? Well, same people. We got a lot in common in this church. David says, the waters are coming into my soul. He says, I sink in deep mire. I'm sinking, Lord. I am sinking. I am going down, Lord. You ever had that sinking feeling? I went through a season several years back now. I'm terrible with time. It could be four or five years, maybe even longer. I had some physical issues, but I think the physical issues were a result of the emotional and mental situation that I found myself in. But I, I described it to someone that I felt like there was weights attached to me and were pulling me down. I literally felt like I was sinking. I could not only feel that pressure emotionally, I felt it spiritually, and I also felt it physically. I was sinking. And David says, I'm sinking. And, the, and the, the worst part of sinking is described in the next thing he says, where there is no standing. I cannot get a footing. I'm sinking, Lord. And there is, there's no place for me to get a sure footing. You can't stand if there's no footing. You can't fight if you can't be grounded. And so there's this hopeless feeling, this hopeless situation that David finds himself in. He says, I come into deep waters where the floods overflow me. And notice what he says, I am weary of my crying. Have you ever cried until you have no tears left? I'm just tired of crying. That's a tough place to be in. David says, I'm weary of my crying. He says, my throat is dried. I've cried out until I've lost my voice. Mine eyes fail. My eyes are literally tired. And tired of what? He says, while I wait for my God. I'm sinking, Lord. I'm sinking fast. The waters are rising and I am sinking and I've been crying and I've been crying and I've been looking to you. I've been waiting for you. So what, what can we take away so far in this psalm? What do you do when you feel like you're sinking? What do you do when you feel like you're drowning? What do you do when you've cried and you have no more tears? What do you do when you've cried out and you have no more voice? It's easy. You give up. No, no, that's not what you do. You wait. Now, we need, to, we need to really get this. I'm praying the Lord will help us to see this. When you're drowning, the last thing you want to do is wait. You're drowning. There's no time for waiting. When you're sinking, the last thing you want to do is wait. I shared a story one time. Uh, my grandfather had a, a lease on Tinsaw River, and, and they had a cabin there, and I had a motorcycle as a teenager, and they had, for some reason, I, I can't remember, they dug this deep ditch, and they just kind of put water, I mean, uh, dirt back in this ditch, but it really hadn't settled or anything, and we had a torrential rain before that for, for days and days and days and days, and I'm out there riding my motorcycle, I come up over a hill, I come down that hill, and I hit where that was. I didn't know that it was there. I thought it was just solid. And I started sinking. Now, I didn't know at the time they had dug a hole. My grandfather, he knew. I didn't know that they had just pushed some dirt in there and it was still loose and partly filled with water, but it was dry across the top and I hit it with my motorcycle and I'm sinking. Now, my brain's thinking quicksand. My brain's thinking, 
I'm about to die because I'm holding on to a weight. And I start crying out for my grandfather. Paw, paw, paw. And he comes running around from the cabin and he looks at me and he sees me sinking. And he does something that I'll never forget. It struck me odd when he did it. He's standing there, I don't know, from, from here to Dunmire Street, and he is laughing his head off. And I'm thinking, wait, this isn't funny. I'm about to die. Now, he knew how deep the hole was. He knew everything. He knew all the details of the situation. But I was sinking. I was dying. At least I thought. So he took his time while he was laughing, and I'm holding him for dear life, right? And he gets the truck and he pulls me out and explains to me the whole thing. And looking back, then I laugh too, but in the moment, you feel like you don't have time to wait. You feel like there's no time for the rescue. And that's where David is right now. But he does all that he can do. You have two choices in those situations. You can give up or you can wait. I wouldn't recommend giving up. A lot of people give up right before God moves. Now, I mentioned Peter in Matthew chapter 14. It would be good to give you a little tidbit of information from that experience. Not only are we told that Peter cried out, Save me! The next thing we're told that Jesus, listen, we're told that Jesus, you paying attention? That Jesus immediately caught him by the hand and lifted him up. Immediately. Now you say, well, wait a minute, well, Gordon, how does that apply to David's situation? Because it doesn't seem like there's an immediate factor in play. But see, that's just it. My grandfather knew the situation I was in. And God knows the situation I'm in. And God knows the situation David is in. And whenever God gets ready, he can do the immediate. And the immediate is always at the right time. Therefore, I wait. I wait, Lord. I'm waiting. And we don't like waiting. We're Americans. We got instant grits. We got instant tea, instant coffee. We like instant prayer. We like instant miracles. We like instant spiritual growth. We like instant Bible studies. Now David has described with these poetic terms what it's like for him right now. And now he's going to give us some clues into why he feels that way. Look at verse 4. They that hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of mine head. They that would destroy me, being mine enemies wrongfully, are mighty. Then I restored that which I took not away. O oh God, thou knowest my foolishness, and my sins are not hid from thee. Now, as I said at the beginning of this study, there are, there are bits and pieces that apply to Christ, and some scholars try to take the whole psalm and apply everything to him, and obviously this last verse that we read, verse 5, does not apply to the Lord. So we've got to be careful in trying to fit every little piece of a Messianic psalm into Jesus' life. He says, Let not them that wait on thee, O Lord, of host, Lord God of hosts, be ashamed for my sake. Let not those that seek me be confounded for my sake, O God of Israel. Now David causes us to, to be reminded of something that we need to remember. If you're here tonight and you're going through a tough time in your life, it's not just about you. Other people are watching. David says, Lord, I'm asking you to save me, yes, but those people who are watching me right now, seeing me in this situation, knowing that I'm waiting for you, knowing that I'm praying to you, Lord, don't let them be let down either. Because what happens in my life is going to affect their life too. He says, let not them that wait on thee, O Lord of hosts, 
be ashamed for my sake. Let not those that seek thee be confounded for my sake, O God of Israel, because for thy sake have I borne reproach. Shame hath covered my face. I am become a stranger unto my brethren and an alien unto my mother's children. And here's a verse that Jesus, that is applied to Jesus. For the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. Re the reproaches of them that reproach thee are fallen upon me. When I wept and chastened my soul with fasting, that was to my reproach. They laughed. They made fun. I made sackcloth also my garment and became a proverb to them. They that sit in the gate speak against me. I I'm the gossip of the town. And then he says, I was the song of the drunkards. Now, I have a confession to make. I don't have a lot of patience for drunks. I don't know about you, but I don't like being around people that are drunk. Anybody? Well, I'm not going to, don't raise your hand. Because if you do, I'm going to, well. And hopefully none of you like being drunk. But people that are drunk, just, and David says, those people are singing songs about me. They're making up jingles about my situation and my condition. Of all people, the drunks are singing about me. But as for me, my prayer is unto thee. Wow, I love that. These are some of the things that make David the man that David is, that we admire. They're, they're reproaching him, they're mocking him, they're making fun of him, they're singing songs about him, they're gossiping him, and what does he do? He prays. Let them do whatever they're going to do. I'm going to make my prayer to you. And look what he says. But as for me, my prayer is unto thee, O Lord, in an acceptable time, O God. In the multitude of thy mercies, hear me in the truth of thy salvation. Now, we all like to pray, but how many of us pray, Lord, when you think it's the right time, do it. Now it's easy to pray when it's not an urgent emer emergency, but when you're drowning like David, when you're sinking like him, this is unsinkable faith. David says, I'm waiting on you. I'm waiting. I'm waiting, Lord. I <gasps> I'm, wa I'm waiting. Whenever, <gasps> whenever you're ready, you take care of it. Unsinkable faith. I'm reminded of Job, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. I'm reminded of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Our God can deliver us. Then they get excited. Our God will deliver us. But if he don't, hmm, he says, Lord, in an acceptable time. How, how do you do that? How do you get there? Paul says in Romans, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God acceptable in your time Lord in your time wow unsinkable faith he says oh God in the multitude of thy mercy hear me in the truth of thy salvation he says deliver me he starts off saying save me Lord and then he says deliver me that literally means to snatch away He's asking the Lord to do what he did for Peter. Take me by the hand and lift me up out of this. Deliver me out of the mire and let me not sink. Let me be delivered from them that hate me and out of the deep waters. Let not the water flood overflow me, neither let the deep swallow me up. And let not the pit shut her mouth upon me. Wow! 
Jesus talks about a pit that is bottomless. It goes on and on and on and on and on. Down, 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 down. And David feels like I'm going down and down and down and down and down. Lord, deliver me. Now, faith preachers don't like Psalm 69 because it doesn't describe what they like to describe. But I'm thankful for the Psalms because, as we've said multiple times, for every sigh, there is a psalm. And we need to know what to do when we're where David is. So far, here's what we do. We wait. Boy, that makes you want to shout, don't it? Wait when you're drowning. Wait when you're sinking. Number two, pray. We pray. I don't know about you, but I'm tempted to faint in these times. David has already said that he's weary. In Luke 18, Jesus told a parable that men ought always to pray and not faint. Prayer is David's lifeline. It's all he's left to do. He has no footing. He has no standing. He is sinking. He is drowning. He's waiting and praying. Now, it's interesting. If Jesus taught the parable that men ought always to pray and not faint, that means if we don't pray, we're going to faint. We're going to faint. We also need to keep in mind that this psalm, right, has is, is got some messianic overtones to it. The zeal of thine house has eaten me up. Those type of things. The reproaches that were reproached to thee has fallen on me. Those type of things. In Hebrews chapter 12, we're told this. Consider him who endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be weary and faint in your mind. We need to pray so that we don't faint. And we need to consider him we need to wait for Him. We need to look to Him. Here's something else we need to do so that we don't faint. Galatians tells us, Be not weary in doing well, for you reap in due season if you don't faint or don't quit. Remember what we just read. David says, they're mocking me, they're making fun of me, I'm the talk of the town, they're gossiping about me, the drunkards are singing about me, but my prayer is unto you. I'm going to keep doing well. I'm not going to lose sight of the prize. If we lose sight of the prize, we're going to faint. And we are such immediate people instant gratification. And that is the exact opposite of sacrifice. God calls us to sacrifice. We don't like the idea of sacrifice. Animals know nothing of sacrifice. A wolf will take down a big mammal and will gorge himself and eat every last drop to the bone thinking nothing of tomorrow, nothing of the future. But sacrifice is connected to time. If you and I were living in the same place and we took down a large animal, hopefully we wouldn't. If we were wise, we wouldn't. We wouldn't take that animal, gorge ourselves, and eat all of it. No, we would take part of it and eat Maybe we'd share part of it with the people around us and then we would try to preserve some of it for the future. We would make a sacrifice for the future. We, we, we don't need to look for instant gratification. We need to sacrifice, have delayed satisfaction, knowing, that's what Paul says, don't grow weary in doing what is well. You're going to reap. He's going to come through. It's just a matter of time. Wait on the Lord. Seek the Lord. Trust the Lord. Amen? Amen? And what you're going through may be the Lord's chastisement. So what I would encourage you to ask, Lord, are you trying to tell me something in this? 
Instead of asking why all the time, maybe what? What is this for? What is the purpose? What are you trying to say to me? Because we're told that we're not to faint at the Lord's chastisement. We're to endure it. We need to learn the lesson. So, hear me, O Lord, for thy loving kindness is good. Why do we tend to think that God stops being good when things stop being good? Why are we tempted to measure the goodness of God based on the goodness that's happening in my life? Great, God is good, God is good, God is good. The doctor says, you got this, God ain't good no more. God is good, God is good, God is good. I lose my job. Why'd God stop being good? He's still good. Amen. And David recognizes that. He don't feel very good. His situation doesn't look very good. But he's saying, Lord, hear me, hear me, because thy loving kindness is good. You're still good. Even though this don't feel good, you are still good. Turn unto me according to the multitude of thy tender mercies, and hide not thy face from thy servant. For I am in trouble. Hear me speedily. Draw nigh unto my soul and redeem it. Deliver me because of mine enemies. Thou hast known my reproach, my shame, my dishonor. Mine adversaries are all before thee. Reproach hath broken my heart. And I am full of heaviness. Wow. I'm full of heaviness. You ever been full of heaviness? I want to share a little something with you to encourage you. In times like this, when we feel that heaviness, keep in mind that the kabod, the glory of the Lord, is heavy. It means heaviness or weightiness. Maybe, just maybe, maybe that heaviness is God drawing near. Some of you are like, mm -mm, that don't sound right right there. I rebuke you, Satan, you know, that kind of thing. Do you know that the psalmist says the Lord is a very present help in time of trouble? We need to stop thinking the way that we think. We've got a Western mentality. We've got an Americanized gospel mentality. If it's good, God's good. If it's bad, God's bad. If I feel good, God loves me. If I feel bad, God don't. If I feel weight and heaviness, that's bad. Maybe not. He says, I looked for some to take pity, but there was none and for comforters, but I found none. Ever felt that way? Would you forgive me if I told you tonight that's a good place to be? Yeah, Gordon, you don't understand. Nobody cares. Nobody understands. I made 14 phone calls. Nobody answered. There was nobody there. Really? That's right, nobody, 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 nobody. Well, yes, the Lord was there, but that's not what I'm talking about. Sometimes the Lord puts us in that situation so that he is the only somebody. Because if, if you're down to nobody and he's the only somebody, you'll never learn that he's the only body that you really, really need. Yes, thank God that he uses other people in our lives, but we don't have to have them. And God doesn't have to use them to reach us, to comfort us, to help us. They gave me gall for my meat, and in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. There's another reference to Christ. Now this is another breakaway from, 
from David and, and the Lord, verses 22 through 28. Let's read it real quick. Let their table become a snare before them that they should have been for their welfare. Let it become a trap. Let their eyes be darkened that they see not and make their loins continually shake. Pour out thine indignation upon them and let thy wrathful anger take hold on them. Let them... Let their habitation be desolate and let none dwell in their tents. For they persecute with persecute him whom thou hast smitten, and they talk to the grief of those whom thou hast wounded. Add iniquity unto their iniquities and let them not come into thy righteousness. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living and not be written with the righteous. Wow. That's some serious praying right there. But you ought to see the, the crazy gymnastics that the scholars try to do to make this fit Christ. It doesn't fit because on the cross, Jesus says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He says, but I am poor and sorrowful. Let thy salvation, O God, set me on high. I will praise the name of God with a song. I will magnify him with thanksgiving. Wow! David says, I'm sinking, Lord. I'm drowning, Lord, but I'm going to sing. I'm sinking, Lord. I'm drowning, Lord, but I'm going to thank you. My enemies are more than the hairs of my head, but I'm going to sing. My reproach, my shame, they mock me. They gossip against me. They sing songs against me, but I'm going to sing. I'm going to sing for you. I'm going to thank you. You, if we, are, if we haven't learned that, wow. He says, I'm going to thank you, Lord. This also shall please the Lord better than an ox or bullock that hath horns and hooves. If I would offer the whole thing, thanksgiving is more pleasing to him. The humble shall see this and be glad, and your heart shall live that seek God. For the Lord heareth the poor and despiseth not his prisoners. Let the heaven and the earth praise him, the seas and everything that moveth therein. For God will save Zion and will build the cities of Judah that they may dwell there and have it in possession. The seed also of his servants shall inherit it, and they that love his name shall dwell therein. Un sinkable faith. Now, we got to be careful because the faith preacher would cause us to think that this unsinkable faith is something that we wield and we have and we have some kind of power over. No, unsinkable faith is faith in the unsinkable one. He's not going down, so I'm not going down. He's not going to drown, so I'm not going to drown. The disciples are in the boat with Jesus. Jesus said, let us go to the other side. Jesus falls asleep in the boat. The storm comes up and they run around like chickens with their head cut off. They wake the Lord up. Lord, don't you care that we're drowning? We're going to die. Do we really think that Jesus is going to drown? Do we really think that he's going under? He's unsinkable. And if my faith's in him, I have unsinkable faith. I just need to learn to wait. I just need to learn to pray. I just need to learn to praise him and sing to him and thank him. And that goes against everything that the flesh knows and understands. And that's why we need to be doing it. I'm going to blow your mind real quick. Psalm 72. We got nine minutes. We're going to do it. We're going to do it. Our great king in this psalm, five sections looking at the reign of scholars debate, whether it's Solomon or David. Notice the title says a psalm for Solomon. Some say Solomon is the author. Some say David is the author. When we get to the very end of the psalm, we'll see that the, the prayers of David are ended. Those who believe it's Solomon believe that Solomon is wrapping up book two, and so he's saying the prayers of David for that section are ended. Others believe that David wrote this for his son, 
And that's why it says the prayers of David are ended. I'll let you determine which one you think. It doesn't change the application at all. But he speaks of an equitable reign, one that is fair and just. He speaks of an eternal reign. He speaks of an expansive reign. He speaks of an excellent reign. And he speaks of an exalted reign. I also believe that this has some messianic overtones as well, speaking of Christ and his reign. Let's just read through it real quick and we'll touch on a few points. He says, Give the king thy judgments, O God, and thy righteousness unto the king's son. Wow. Wouldn't it be nice to have some leaders that prayed like that? He shall judge thy people with righteousness and thy poor with judgment. The mountains shall bring peace to the people and the little hills by righteousness. He shall judge the poor of the people. He shall save the children of the needy and shall break in pieces the oppressor. Wow, he's going to preside justly. That's the prayer. Let the king preside and judge rightly, fairly. Because of him, we're going to prosper. Talking about the hills and the righteousness. And he's going to protect us. That's the prayer for the king. Verse 5. They shall fear thee as long as the sun and moon endure throughout all generations. He shall come down like rain upon the mown grass as showers that water the earth. In his days shall the righteous flourish an abundance of peace so long as the moon endureth. Wow, an eternal rain. As long as the sun shines, as long as the rain falls, as long as the moon is in the sky, he says. And he talks about his dominion. He shall have dominion also from sea to sea <laughs> and from the river unto the ends of the earth. They that dwell in the wilderness shall bow before him and his enemies shall lick the dust. The kings of Tarshish and the isles shall bring presents. The king, kings of Sheba and Seba shall offer gifts. Yea, all kings shall fall down before him. All nations shall serve him. For he shall deliver the needy when he crieth. The poor also, and him that hath no helper, he shall spare the poor and needy and shall save the souls of the needy. He shall redeem their soul from deceit and violence, and precious shall their blood be in his sight. Wow! What a leader. Concerned about the pitiful, the poor, and the persecuted. <laughs> How long has it been since we've had a leader that was concerned for the pitiful, the poor, and the persecuted? Most leaders are concerned about the, the powerful and the prosperous and the politically connected. And yet we believe when we get our man or our woman in there, it's all going to be different. And he shall live. To him shall be given the gold of Sheba. Prayer also shall be made for him continually. Wow! What would happen if the church made prayer continually for its leaders? What if every Christian, every day of his entire administration, prayed for Joe Biden? Or in the past, Donald Trump? Or Obama? Or Bush? We could just or whoever's next, Hillary, whoever, whatever. What if? What if we prayed as much as we complained? Wow. He says, let that prayer be continual, he says, and daily shall he be praised. There shall be an handful of corn in the earth upon the top of the mountains. Fruit thereof shall shake like Lebanon. 
and they of the city shall flourish like grass on the earth. His name shall endure forever. His name shall be continued as long as the sun, and men shall be blessed in him. All nations shall call him blessed. Blessed be the Lord God, the God of Israel, who only doeth wondrous things. And blessed be his glorious name forever, and let the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. The prayers of David, the son of Jesse, are ended. So the psalm is written for the king. We don't know much about kings. I mean, we've read stories about kings. We've looked at history about kings. But as Americans, we really have no concept of what it's like to be under a king. As a matter of fact, we left the dominion of a king and then tried to establish a king. The first president that we elected, we tried to get him to continue being president and he refused. Amazing. Good luck finding a leader today who will say, no, 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 I'm not going to do another term. I don't want any more power. I don't want any more control. We tried to make him a king. And we read the Old Testament and we say, oh, that terrible Israel. They just wanted a king. They rejected God and they wanted a king like everyone else. How could they do such a thing when they had the Lord? Mm -hmm. We read in the New Testament, there before Pilate, okay, I'm going to re release Barabbas, but what shall I do with Jesus, the king of the Jews? away with him, away with him, crucify him, crucify him. We have no king but Caesar. We have no king but Caesar. This is a prayer for the king. These individuals loved Israel. They loved the nation. They loved the king. And they prayed for the king. And we're praying. Most Americans are praying for a king, a president. But our president, he's got to have our jersey. He's got to be on our team. He's got to, he's got to align with our little, you know, our little things that we're into. And we all have them. There are things that concern me. And when I'm thinking about voting, I'm, I'm thinking about someone who is concerned about those issues. And we all have our little issues. And it's funny how we're blinded to each other's issues. Amen. Because your issues aren't important. <laughs> Who cares about that? My issues are the ones that are important. And you look at me and go, well, your issues aren't that important. I don't care about your issues. How could you not care about my issues? You're not American. You know, we, we do all of those kind of things. I just want to encourage us, and I've been doing it for a while because God had convicted my heart. He's delivered me. And we've had people leave the porch over this subject. And I say, God bless you. Amen. We love you. We'll receive you when you come back, if you ever do. If not, the Lord be with you. The Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you. The Lord be gracious unto you and give you peace. I'm not going back. I, I'm not going back. Jesus says this. When you pray, pray like this. Our Father which art in heaven, we ask you desperately, give us a Republican president. No, no, that ain't how it goes. Okay, let me try that again. Our Father which art in heaven, we ask you desperately, please give us a Democrat president. Because what this country needs is an elephant. Or what this country needs is a donkey. No, what this country needs is God. He says, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy, what we're reading, thy kingdom Come. Do we really want that? I don't answer out loud. I'm pretty sure that everybody here does, but, but if you think about the church as a whole, do we really want his kingdom to come? And what would happen? What would happen if I was, if I was so engrossed in his kingdom and his righteousness as I was in 2020 with political garbage? You guys do know that the world ended, right? After the last election. We're not really here. We're in a dream. 
America fell, the world blew up, World War III happened, and, and it's... But that's what, that's what people were saying. That's what people were thinking. That's how people were acting. I want his kingdom to come. Amen. I'm looking for a king who's concerned about the pitiful, Amen. not the powerful. Yes. I'm looking for a king who's concerned about the poor and not the prosperous. Yes. Who's concerned about those who are persecuted, not those who have political connections. That's what I'm looking for. And you know what? He's coming. He's coming. And we're, we're not looking. We're looking for something else. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Yeah, but if we get this guy in there, I'll have this and I'll have that and I'll have rights and I'll have freedoms and I'll have liberties and I'll have lower gas prices and I'll have lower food prices and I'll... Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things will be added unto you. God knows how to take care of his people in famine. He knows how to take care of people who are sinking. He knows how to take care of his people who are drowning. It's his kingdom. We don't need to be trying to Americanize anybody. We need to be heavenizing people. And what we fail to remember, and I'll close with this, if we did that more, America would probably be different. If the American church would get out of politics, would lay aside their materialism, set aside their religion, it would go something like this. If my people, which were called by my name, would humble themselves and pray continually and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven I'd forgive their sins and I would heal their land. Amen? Y'all didn't think I could do it. I did go over three minutes, so forgive me. Let's pray.